Radio with Mary Callie on the Fourth Watch Radio Network. I hope everyone's having a blessed week tonight. We have something extremely interesting for you guys. Yes, tonight we're going to be talking about Muslims end times alert with Turkey being the focal point. And this is a show that will feature former PLO terrorist Walid Shuba. Submitted for the approval of the Fourth Watch Radio Network. I call this show End Time Alert, the seat of Satan, Turkey. Hey guys, how you doing? I hope you guys have a blessed week. Listen, I'm going to get right into this. You know, there's a lot going on right now uh, with what's going on with Turkey and with its president that's over there. A lot of people are looking at him and he's doing things that are almost prophetic as far as uh, trying to come up with some sort of peace deal with Israel and everything else that's going on. Keep an eye on that. That is the seat of Satan, by the way, this I think they call that um, the old uh, the old uh, name for it was Pergamus uh, or Pergamus or something like that, which is the seat of Satan, uh, which is Turkey. To be honest with you, please keep an eye on that. Uh, tonight we're going to feature Walid Shubat. Okay, Walid Shubat used to be a former PLO terrorist who actually was really deeply involved in uh, persecuting the Jews and anybody who wasn't Muslim. But he found Jesus Christ. He is a born-again Christian. And now his job and what he's been doing along with his son is they've been spreading the word as far as having people take a look at the fact that the Middle East is a hot spot. But it's not what you think. A lot of people look for... Uh, the Antichrist probably to come from Europe. He brings another perspective as to maybe the Antichrist is more Middle Eastern. But you know what I forgot to do before I even got into this? I need to ask you guys, are you guys good? You're all good, right? God is good all the time, right? All right, God is good. So let's go ahead and get this started. And I hope you enjoy the program. You all have your Bibles? Anybody who forgot to bring their Bibles, please raise your hand. <laughs> Nobody forgot their Bibles? You forgot your Bible, ma'am? Okay. The ushers will take you to the back of the church and shoot you. <laughs> this way we solve this problem, the way we do it in my neck of the woods. You don't forget your Bible when you come to our lead Shabbat conference. Because we've got a lot to discuss. Open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. And I read. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they, may, they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. There are phony so-called believers who come out of the church and they appear as their believers when they're not really believers. That was the problem in the New Testament. But God told us how we can identify those. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and then, and that no lie is of the truth. But how do you know the lie? Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? In other words, anyone who denies that God manifested himself and his son, reincarnate down on earth, and visited earth, and died for the sins of mankind, anyone who doesn't do that is the liar. That's the spirit of the Antichrist, and he continues. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Period. Even the Antichrist himself must deny the Father and must deny the Son. How often do you go to churches these days that talk about that at all? It gives us the first 
thing to recognize about the spirit of the Antichrist. In fact, the Bible in the New Testament says, and they, they live amongst us. They developed the Aryan heresy. The Aryan heresy began to be within the church and began to manifest itself in the church like leaven and began to start talking about doctrine. They began to introduce false doctrine and the most important, the, the, the most uh, key of this false doctrine is the denial of who Christ is. The denial of who the Father is. The denial of the Trinity. The denial that God became flesh. The denial that Jesus was God. The denial in the Father and in the Son. That never ended. That continued to manifest all throughout church history. The Arian heresy never died. It continued even till today. But the church doesn't recognize it. They do not recognize it because when... The West deals with cults, you know, you know, I remember when I first went to church, Fair Oaks Baptist Church in Concord, California, and I began to talk about the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist, the Aryan heresy, Islam, the religion, where I came out of myself. And I remember Pastor Dennis Bailey took me to the side, he says, Walid, here in America we deal with the cults. We're not ignorant of the cults. We deal with the cults all the time. We deal with the Mormons, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, with this and this and that. You know, but what you're talking about here is kind of overboard. You need to kind of tone it down. I said, you don't understand. This was in 1993. 1993. How many years is that? 15 years? 17 years. Somebody knows math better than I. 17 years ago. I said, you have no clue. I said, they're going to blow up your buildings. They're going to kill you. They're going to behead you. Ah, you now you're scaring us a little more. Stop it, you know. Youth pastor, I said, I need to talk to the youth. I need to train them about what's going to happen. I need, you know. Oh no, 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 no. It's overboard. It's 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 going to scare our youth. Scare your youth? You don't know what's coming. They're going to blow you up. They're going to kill you. Terrorism is going to rise, and, and nations are going to rise to come to destroy Israel. All of them going to be Muslim. I was telling them all these things. How did you know all these things? I simply said. I read your book. <laughs> I discovered that they don't read their book. They select verses from Act and this and that. And if you talk about the Psalms, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. They began to apply the Bible only on a personal level, but nothing else. I'm not saying the Bible cannot be applied on a personal level. It can. But it also applies on a nationalistic level. On a global level, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten... God so loved the what? The world. How much our love encompasses? Just our family? I've been witnessing to my mother for 10 years and she doesn't want to believe. I said, forget your mother. Doesn't Jesus say, forget your mother, forget your father, forget all this stuff. You're like a, like a broken record. You know? Sow the seed to everyone. Who are my brothers? These are my brothers. These are my sisters. New family, new outlook. But we're hung up. All our lives we're hung up. I was hung up on my family. My wife Maria was hung up on her family in the beginning. Finally we realized that's a prison. To be hung up on certain people only. I said, you don't read all of your Bible? Thou art Bethlehem Ifrata, though you're the least from the clans of Judah, yet out of you comes to be the deliverer. Everybody knows that verse. That's just the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. I said, what's the rest of the verses? I don't know. Let's look them up. I don't. I already know them because I study the whole thing. The full context. Don't select certain verses. A lot of people have so much problem because they select certain verses and they forget the entire context. The continuation of the story of the birth of the Messiah in Bethlehem. And this one shall be peace. When the Assyrian comes into our land, and he comes to trod into our villages, then we will raise against him, the Assyrian, the Antichrist, seven shepherds and eight principled men, and they will decimate the Assyrian. They'll destroy the Assyrian. Hold on, who is that? We don't know. When was the last time you had a Sunday school? Today we'll be discussing the seven shepherds who will destroy the Antichrist. Where do we think we'll come from? The United States of America. 
United States of America will be one of those. How do I know that? From the Bible. Yet, the message today that's been given out is that, gee whiz, America will collapse. The fall of America. America's going to go down. Watch the economy. Oh, yeah, buy gold. That, all these worries and concerns of everybody. I've seen this happen so many times. Somehow God punishes America, refines it, and raises it up to kick, to kick butt. <laughs> Never fit. Sorry, pastor. <laughs> to kick donkey King James Virgin. <laughs> That's even a worse word. But that's how it is. The spirit of the Antichrist comes from the church. Not now, at the time of the New Testament. The Arian heresy arose, continued and continued and continued. And then the church began to be aware of this. They began to exile the heretics into the deserts of Arabia, here and there. And the heretics got together. And they still continued. They began to build this big blob called Islam. Most Americans don't know Islam is a Christian cult. You see, I think Islam is a different religion. A totally different thing, you know. Now Hinduism is a different religion. But Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, those are cults within the church. Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Jesus was God. That seems to be an antichrist spirit. And Mormons say that Jesus is the brother of Lucifer. That's another Antichrist spirit. But the Antichrist spirit must deny the Father and the Son and the Trinity. That seems to match perfectly the cult of Islam, which tries to come across as part of the church because they say they believe in Jesus. And it comes to persecute the church. Persecute them how? Uh, saying bad words to them? No. Chopping their heads off. Why do you think the Bible says, and I saw the martyrs that were beheaded in the name of Jesus? What part of beheading do you Americans don't get? Do I need to demonstrate? Beheading. I said, they're going to behead you. No one was listening. They're going to kill you. And the ones who will come to kill you will be thinking they're doing God a service. That's what they think. They're killing you thinking they're doing God's a service. What's the church doing these days? Sleep. Total sleep. Slumbering. 1 John 2.22 was very clear. That the spirit of the Antichrist must deny the Father and the Son. That's Islam. Prove it. Every single verse in the Bible. I guarantee you never heard this anywhere. And you'll never hear it again. Every single verse in the Bible that deals with the nations that God deals with, that Jesus Christ deals with, every single of those nations is Muslim, that the God deals with in the ends of time. In fact, in Acts, the gentleman was sharing some verses, why do the kings rage against your anointed one? Well, there is an application of that time about the persecution that they were enduring, yes, but there is a long-term application in Psalms chapter 2, in which it talks about the anointed one, the nation's rage. And that it continues all the way to Psalms chapter 83, Psalm 81, the, you know, the, uh, the haters of the Lord pretend submission to him, it says. The ones who hate God think that they submit to God and they worship God. Then it continues to say in chapter 82 of the psalm, verse 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. Wow, it seems to match what's in Acts, it seems to match what's in Psalm chapter 2, and it continues in Psalm chapter 83 to tell us who those nations that rage against the anointed one is. We study scripture in the West, to apply it to certain things in the church, that's fine. Prayer, this, that, that's fine. But there's more to it than this, because in America people think only on a personal level. We need to think on a nationalistic level and a global level as well. And then it continues to see, to, 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 to explain who these nations are. Come, they have said, let us destroy them. Let us destroy the state of Israel. Come, they have said, let us destroy the nation of Israel. 
that this name be blotted out. Let's blot out the name of Israel. It shall be remembered no more. Let's wipe out Israel. And it tells you what nations they are. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites. They're coming against Christ, the anointed one, to fight against him. I read that in 1993 as a Muslim. And I began to see that I was on the wrong side. Because we were the Arabs, the Ishmaelites. Moab and the Hajarites. Ammon, Amalek, and the people of Tyre, the Lebanese. I knew then that Lebanon is going to turn Islamic. Before Hezbollah took control of Lebanon. And I said this so many things and so many times. Hundreds of these things, I said it from 1993. No one was listening, no one was believing anything I was saying. I was considered an Islamophobe. You talk too much about Islam, you are an Islamophobe. And then, someone wanted to build a mosque by ground zero this few months ago, Faisal Abdul Rauf. And all of a sudden, 71% of Americans objected, they also became Islamophobes just like me. <laughs> few years ago, 71% of Americans would say, I'm an Islamophobe. Now all of a sudden they're Islamophobes. So you know what? The Nazi phobes were right when they warned about Hitler. Sir Winston Churchill was right when he was called a Nazi phobe. He was right. The Nazi phobes are always accused until they are somewhat exonerated in the end. The Nazi phobes were right. If you don't know the story, Lady Astor condemned him in the parliament. She says, Mr. Churchill, I hate you very much. And you're a Nazi phobe. If I was your wife, I will put poison in your tea. And Sir Winston Churchill said, Ma'am, if I was your husband, I will gladly drink it. <laughs> and then she said to him, Sir Winston Churchill, you're nothing but a drunk. He says, Ma'am, you're right. I'm nothing but a drunk. I'm drunk right now and tomorrow... When I sober up and look at you, you'll still be ugly. <laughs> Most of what you learn about the prophetic teaching in the end times is a concoction of recent origin, the last 40, 50 years. We had a war with communist Russia, so Russia became a focus. European Union was rising, so Europe became a focus. Yet you don't find in the Bible the focus on Europe. Perhaps Russia we can argue over Ezekiel 38. Plausible. But the argument is also that Magog is in Asia Minor. And you look at all the Bible maps. Do you know there isn't a single Bible map that shows the Scythians or Magog or Meshech and Tubal of Ezekiel 38, not one map, Bible map shows them in Russia proper, it shows them in Turkey and southern Russia. Are all the Bible maps wrong? They're done by historians. What's in southern Russia? In fact, I've been talking about that before. That should split from Russia proper and they become the CIS nations, the Commonwealth of Independent States, which are Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, all Muslim. Uh, talking to Americans about geography, it's going to be a problem. They're not that good with geography. <laughs> History, same. Well, get with it. What does it take to get a Bible map? Yeah. What does it take to get open a concordance and read what it says? Yeah. What does it take to understand which... There are only probably 20 nations you need to understand that's in the Bible. 20 nations, you know, all together. Put them together and go look them up, put a map. It'd take you probably one hour, graduate as a scholar on the Bible. <laughs> and then now you can read the whole Bible and understand what God's talking about. God is very geographic. He's very historic. He focuses on geographical regions. Certain countries he talks about. In Isaiah chapter 19, it was very clear. You sing the song, behold he comes riding on the clouds, behold he comes riding on the clouds, not the trumpet call. You know how many churches I've been at? I says, okay, you sing the song, behold he comes riding on the clouds, where is he going? Not one church knew. <laughs> not one. Well, he goes to the Mount of Olives, no, nope, that's not what the verse is about, behold he comes riding on the clouds. I said, they always sing songs, you don't know what you're singing. Do you think God appreciates you singing a song about him, you don't know what you're singing, what you're saying? Do you think God accepts your prayers when you don't know what you're talking about? 
Does he not want you to know what you're talking about? Behold, he comes. This is from Isaiah 19, verse 1. Behold, the Lord comes riding on a swift cloud and is coming into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter before him. It's amazing. He's going to fight in Egypt. So in the book of Acts, in the Psalm 2, when Messiah, the come, the nations rage against him, he's telling you what nations are raging against him. And he's telling you what nations he's going to, to defeat them. Christ himself. Small deal. Why is it such a small deal? Because we never read it. God is not an American. That he must adjust himself to fit the American mentality. God focuses on Israel. I could say that God is a Zionist. Because he swears about Zion. In fact, I like to change the song. Our God is an awesome God. Or our God is a Zionist God. Our God is a Zionist God. He reigns from a... He's Zionist. When I found that God was Zionist, I was terrified. Because I was anti-Zionist. But he goes to Egypt to fight the country of Egypt. And he tells you why. He tells you that the believers in Egypt in Isaiah 19, they will cry out for a savior and God will send them a savior and a mighty one. Who's that? The Messiah. To rescue the Christians in Egypt. Who are the Christians of Egypt? What are they called them? Anybody here knows who are the Christians of Egypt? What are they called? Anybody? What are they called them? The pastor knows, but no cheat sheet. The congregation, the sheep. What do they call that? Who? Who said that? Always. Either they have salt or they have no hair whatsoever. Those are the ones that knows all the answers to everything. <laughs> the pepper are in limbo land. Too young. Coptic. The Coptic Christians. Even God did not forget to mention those Coptic Christians in the Bible. Eastern Christians. And by the way, they're Greek Orthodox. They're not even evangelical. The Greek Orthodox. And they cry out for God to send them a savior. And God sends them the Messiah to fight in Egypt. Is that not a big deal? He talks about the persecution. In fact, the chapter of Acts 2 is talking about the persecution of the believers. The persecuted. What have you done about the persecuted? I just got a phone call from a manager today. I was upset with him about something. I was yelling at him. He knows how to calm me down. He says, uh, perhaps, Wally, this will calm me down. What? Brother Kaiser Ayub has been rescued He's a, you know, as a persecuted believer, we're f trying to help him. You know what it cost? I was speaking at a major church, 8,000 members in California. The pastor, good friend of mine. Pastor, would you like to help us? Just kind of sign a letter to help this persecuted Christian in Pakistan. He's under blasting law. They're going to chop off his head. Oh yeah, no problem, oh yeah. We assembled an A-team to rescue these people. We're pouring thousands of dollars to rescue these people. We moved them from Pakistan secretly all the way to Thailand. They're in hiding in Thailand. Let me speak a word of, of that language. They're in an apartment hiding. They send one of them out. They've been there for a year. Pastor, it's time for you to send me this letter. We need to help them to the United Nations. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, I don't want to be involved. I don't want to be involved. The A team we assembled called him for his letter. He says, no, 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 I don't want to be involved. He didn't tell me what his intents were. They fractured. They don't want to do anything with us. They said, well, you guys must be flakes. Why are we flakes? What's going on? Finally, you find out what's going on. He doesn't want nothing to do with it. Because now push comes to shove. Now he knows where the rubber meets the road. He knows his name will be on the line. Cops out. I call him up. I said, pastor, everybody in my phone book. They're doers, not talkers. Tell me what reason should I have your number on my phone book? Tell me. Your name is blotted out. I no longer know you. Get lost. Have you forgotten all the things I did for you? Yes. You invited me to speak at your church. I sold tons of books. Yes, we got a lot of money selling books at your church. But that means nothing to me. What means something to me is this. Not the book sales. It's not about money. Got rid of them. 
They think because they're an 8,000 member church, they're a big deal. Look at this church. How many are here tonight? 100? That's the narrow gate. That's the people who are going to do something. They showed up on Friday. And finally, from Germany, I run an APB on an, on an Assyrian Christian internet television that I contribute every week and I send an APB. It says, anyone with guts in this country wants to help these people, let us know. Nobody from America wanted to help. We got all the way from East Germany. Called this pastor. His father was a pastor. Brought three other pastors. Went to the German embassy and got the asylum in Germany. Why did they help? Because they lived in East Germany. They're accustomed to what, what persecution is. They tasted the bitter herbs. They know what it's like to be under the gun. They know how they felt when they were being persecuted under the communists. They came and extended their hand for help, and they helped. That's how it is. So it is necessary for Christians in America to taste a bitter herb. So they can know what it's like. And many Americans tell me that, you know, gee whiz, but America is not going to survive. America is going to be down. Open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 11, and let's see what God is dealing with. We're going to monitor the Antichrist tonight. Tonight we'll talk about Antichrist. I know we're supposed to be speaking about Jesus, but Jesus said be as wise as serpents. And to understand the serpentine wisdom, we must also understand how the devil functions. Without understanding how the devil functions, you're going to fall for his tricks every time. No question about it. And in Daniel chapter 11, what does it say? Then the king shall do according to his own will, in verse 36, he shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods. What does that mean? He will blaspheme the god of the Bible. How does one blaspheme the god of the Bible? Number one, to deny his essence. Denies the trinity, 1 John 2.22. Denies God's edicts. You know, you can be a blasphemer of God if you deny God's edicts. If God said, I will set up my holy hill on Mount Zion, and you say, I don't care about Israel. I don't care about the creation, recreation of Israel. I don't care about them Jews. Do you know you're blaspheming God? It's blasphemy. You can't deny God's edicts in the Bible and call yourself a believer. And shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what he has been determined shall be done. Then it goes on, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. He does not honor the ancestors, the God of his ancestors. In other words, he comes from a nation that his ancestors were believers. But for some reason, that nation will no longer be believers and they will have an Aryan heresy. They will deny God. They will be converted to something else. Now, the Bible talks about the country of Turkey. Turkey? Turkey? What does that have to do with the Bible? Excuse me? Do you know what Jesus was said about Turkey? Jesus said, Pergamus, thou art the seat of Satan. Big deal or small deal? Where's Pergamus? Turkey. Where's all the seven churches came from? Turkey. Where's the devil going to settle his seat? His Antichrist. Turkey. Even in Ezekiel chapter 30, on the day of the Lord, what's God dealing with? Turkey. When was the last time Americans read about Turkey in the Bible? Never. Yet the old Christians did. They focused on these things. The new church in limbo. Why? Because we are in the midst of a falling away. If the falling away must come first, then the man of sin is revealed. Since you all believe we're close to the coming of Jesus Christ then we must be in the midst of the falling away. If we are in the midst of the falling away, where is the falling away? Tell me. Look around. Turn Christian television. It's right there. It's a nation that believes in only signs and wonders. And Jesus, they come to him and say, we healed in your name. We cast devils in your name. Depart from me, I never knew you, you doers of iniquity. 
their signs and wonders and all that they care about is only the benefits. We heal in your name. We did this. God bless me. A neo-charismatic movement that is very destructive, that has taken the church on a, tur on a journey of simply choosing parts of the Bible, but not the entire scripture. All the Bible is the counsel of God, every single word of it. Well, Walid, I'm not interested in your prophetic teaching. I'm only here to preach Jesus and Him crucified. And many will say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Sure. I also want to preach Jesus and Him crucified. But if that's it, then why didn't God give us the four spiritual laws in a booklet? You tell me. You tell me if all that other stuff is not important. It's very important. It's not four spiritual laws in a booklet. God didn't give us four spiritual laws in a booklet. He gave us an entire Bible. Many of you don't like my message, I can tell. <laughs> it's warning you about the traps of the devil. It's warning you about the traps of this nation. What's going to happen? Let's continue on. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. Where does it say that the Antichrist is homosexual? I always ask that question. They say, right there, he does not desire women. False. That's not what it says. He will not honor the desire of women. You notice, I'm studying only two verses and how meticulous I'm being. Because that's how you need to study scripture. Very meticulously, in a very boring fashion. You want to find gold? You better do a lot of panhandling and a lot of digging. Dirty work. There is no, it's going to come to you. Pastor, give it to me. No, you're going to have to search for it yourself. If the pastor finds a nugget, he's going to keep it. I'm not going to give you my nuggets either. The problem is with giving nuggets is people don't appreciate it. You put it in a book and you sell it to them because they paid for it, then they read it. From 1993 all the way to 2004, all my nuggets were for free. No one was reading it. Finally, I slapped it in a book, charged, people were buying it. Why? Why I don't want it for free? Because that's the way the nature of Westerners are. They want to pay for it, then it's worth something. All right. He doesn't say he does not desire women. It says he does not honor the desire of women. Does not care about women's desires, wants, needs, rights. It's an anti-right, women's right movement. Not an American anti-women's right of abortion. No, 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 no. Anti-women, period. Women has no rights whatsoever. No right to vote, no right to drive a car, no right to, no right to, you know, anything. They have no rights. Women becomes a second class citizen. Persecution of women is the sign of the Antichrist. Who's persecuting women? Where? What about Sharia laws? It's about the persecution of women. But why does the devil want to persecute women? People, most people don't understand it. The reason the devil wants to persecute women is because God already prophesied about that in the beginning of Genesis. I will put enmity between you, the devil, and the woman. You will hate the woman, always. Why? Because the woman, right there in the context of Genesis, she brought, she will bring forth the seed of the Messiah. Period. Sorry guys, God chose them. So if you beat your wife, you're really following the devil. And I was a Muslim, I was reading this stuff, and me and Maria were not getting along. We were fighting like cats and, you know, and dogs. And I was very abusive, and I had an Islamic abusive male mentality. My wife would wait to sleep, and I'll get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and fling her bed, and she'd be up on the wall, violent. But Maria was a Mexican raised girl and she was raised from a Catholic background and she can put up with a lot of crap. <laughs> she shouldn't, but she did. And she was patient and patient and patient. I remember the day I was reading this, I go like, I am not following God. And I began to read all the way from Genesis to Revelation. 
I remember the day I was saved. I said, Jesus, come in. I didn't do the four spiritual laws. Jesus, come in. That was it. I was filled with his joy. I couldn't figure out. Joy. What's this joy in my heart? What? Why am I so happy? Am I drunk in the spirit? What is it? I went upstairs, turned the light on, and my wife, like, as usual, she jolted up. She think, she's thinking the usual. She's going to in the mattress and against the wall. I said, honey, I am so happy. And I said, honey, I want to talk to you. I said to her, I just become Christian. She said, what? I said, become Christian. I love you, honey, very much. She said, honey, I love you too. Why don't you turn off the light? And tomorrow I think you'll be okay. <laughs> Back to normal. A month later passes and she says, you're not the husband that I know. You're a different husband. I said, would you like the old husband back? She says, no, I did not like the old husband. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want the new husband to remain my new husband. And so life continued. But it was reading the scriptures through reading the word of God. And this is what I read. And all the things I read, and this is what I understood because I prayed to God to show me the truth. And it was like the Niagara Falls. I began to write and document, write and document, take notes of what was going on with me and everything else. By the time I walked in Sunday school, I began to talk in Sunday school. I began to realize that the church was disconnected with the Word of God, even though they claimed to believe in the Word of God. The Bible is a manuscript that if you allow God to read Himself to you, you'll be blessed. If you read into it, you will be cursed. It's a blessing and it's a curse. The blind won't see it and they'll be cursed because they will manipulate it and not understand what it says. Do not be part of the cursed. Part of the curse was when Jesus came the first time. They said, ah, oh, he must come riding on a horse, on a white horse, and he will come to rid us from the Roman Empire. That was the concept at that time. They went to synagogue. They sacrificed lambs and goats. They did everything God was supposed to tell them to do from a legal point. But they missed out because when the Messiah came in accordance to Zechariah the prophet riding on a donkey, guess what happened? They rejected him for misinterpreting horse versus donkey. I don't really care if he comes on a donkey and a horse. And probably the pastor would say, not this pastor, the local pastor would say, you know what, it doesn't matter. We, you know, we, we differ on eschatology. It doesn't matter uh, as long as we all agree on the main things. You hear that all the time. We agree on the main doctrine. As long as we agree on the main doctrine, that's all that matters. That's false. It does matter how you interpret eschatology. Because the first believers that misinterpreted eschatology missed the Messiah because he did not come riding on a horse and they ended up in hell because they were never believers. They were believers in the Pharisees. The Pharisees were preaching that message and they followed the Pharisees. Their masters were the Pharisees. Their masters were their own flesh because they wanted victory. It was all about their own glory. It was not about God's glory. And that's what happened. And if the first coming, people were so confused, what makes you think that the second coming is any different? And if the first coming, donkey versus horse, made all the difference, what makes you think that not knowing Christ's second coming is not going to make the same amount of difference? Don't be confused. They will lie to you. Many of them. It tells you right here and right there and everywhere. Everything about his second coming. And it tells you about this antichrist who will hate women. And he will go on to say, look what it says. In verse 38, but in their place, remember in verse 37 it says, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. He, see you, Ali? He does not regard any God. He's an atheist. That's not true. It's not what it says. He will not regard any other God. He will magnify himself as a God. That's true. But how does one magnify himself as a God? Is he going to say, I am God, worship me? Not necessarily. The Muslim world worships a man, not God. They worship Muhammad. There's only two idols that people worship. They can either worship the earth, like Al Gore does, or they can either worship a man, 
Al Gore tells Americans, you must get rid of your children. You must have abortions, women. Is that honoring women? You must abort the children because Mother Earth is going to be filled with too many children. You listened to that crap for so many years, and Americans began to give birth 1.8 children per family, including Christians that go to church. When God said in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply, make a lot of family. You cannot make family, you cannot make a nation without family. It's impossible to make a nation without producing children. America will die if they don't produce children. Yet God still loves America, so he brings the Mexicans in by the droves. <laughs> and the Mexicans, so I tell Maria, I said, Maria, I'm not worried about Mexicans coming to this country. Mexicans are great. They have great women. The food is great. And all of a sudden, Mexicans come to this country, and all of a sudden, they're Americans. They join the military, they join the police force, they, join, they become productive citizens, and all of a sudden, they're proud Americans. They change from thinking Mexico to thinking America, and they become loyal to the country that's housed them, and they appreciate it. Not the Muslims. They never change. They're not allowed to give allegiance to any other nation except the nation of Islam, which is global. You see, Christianity is a very nationalistic faith. God ordained nations right in Genesis in the Tower of Babel. So it's really very simple. Let me make simple as a child can understand it. The devil is international. God is very nationalistic. And God moves nations when the devil wants to take control of the world. Always. He moves nations when the devil wants to control the world. He will never allow the devil to rule the entire earth because he loves the earth. Never. The idea that Lucifer will control the whole earth is not biblical. As soon as he wanted to rule the earth, under one language, what did God say? God, collectively, the Trinity, let us go down and confuse their tongue. Christ came. And he confused their tongue. And they changed different nationals. So now we have America. God bless America, you know. And then he had Japan arise, worshipping the emperor. God send America. Boom, boom. That was the end of the story. <laughs> Hitler rose. God bless America. And God cursed Nazism. Boom, 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 boom. Carpet bomb it. Dresden was carpet bomb. It's over. God used America every single time. Is God going to use America again? Yes. Evidence? Keep going with me. In verse 38, but we just studied one verse. My time is almost up. But in their place, in the gods of his, in the place of the gods of his fathers, he shall honor a god of fortresses. The Antichrist will honor a god of war. God of fortresses. How clear can it get? He will honor a god of war. Excuse me, he's not atheist. Doesn't mean that he doesn't exalt, honor any other God, means he's atheist. He will honor a God of war. Well, Wally, that's kind of an allegory. Continue on. No, it's not an allegory that he just loves war so much, it's like a God. Or, no, he will honor a God. There is a deity, there is a deity of war, who's the God of this world, who's Lucifer, Satan, who loves war. Lucifer loves war. God loves peace. Everything about God versus Lucifer is absolutely the, the opposite. Lucifer is the antithesis of Jesus. The opposite. People think when the Antichrist comes, he's a guy who says, I am Jesus when he's not Jesus. False. That's not what the Bible teaches about the Antichrist. Number one, he is Antichrist. Against Christ. He denies Christ. He denies his essence. He denies his deity. He denies his crucifixion. He denies the Trinity. He denies Israel. He denies women's rights. He is anti, anti, against. And at the same rate, he wants to replace Christ. You need to understand the full picture of the Antichrist. But in their place, he will honor a God of war, a God of fortresses. And a God, wait a minute, and what? And a God which his fathers did not know. There's a God there. He is religious, very religious. And a God 
who his fathers did not know. Why? Wow, because he comes from Turkey. Christian nation became Muslim nation. In Christendom was in Hagia Sophia. How many Americans know Hagia Sophia was the church of Christendom? What happened to it? Converted to a mosque. And Americans have somebody want to open a mosque by ground zero after killing 3,000 Americans. And they don't even know what's, what in the world's going on. That's a symbol of victory against America. America will become Sharia compliant. Who said that? Faisal Abdul Rauf. Behind the ground zero mosque, the Imam. I was in this church a couple years ago. I've been saying these things. Hopefully you are listening. Now I come to confirm what I've been saying. And what does he say? Oh, he's a Sufi Muslim. He's a, he's a peaceful Muslim. Excuse me. Sufi Islam is not peaceful Islam. In fact, I was sharing a pulpit with James Woolsey, the head of the CIA. And I said, Mr. Woolsey, with all due respect, you're an honorable man and a good Christian brother. With all due respect, you don't know what you're talking about. There is no Imam that is a peaceful Muslim. Name me one. Well, Hisham Qabbani is a, is a Sufi Muslim. Sufi Muslim is mystic Muslims. Those are peaceful brand of Islam. He said, did you read his book, Armageddon? When was the last time you read about what Muslims write about Armageddon? And he says in his book, Armageddon, when the Mahdi comes, who's the Mahdi? The Muslim Messiah. When the Mahdi comes, Christianity will cease to exist. Sure, he condemns Osama bin Laden, because Osama bin Laden should not have declared war in America without the establishment of the Mahdi first. We must have the Muslim Messiah to declare war in the West. Who is this Mahdi? The Mahdi? And it's not only believed by Shia Muslims, it's believed by Sunni Muslims. The Mahdi in Islam brings seven years of peace. Have you been reading Daniel lately? He will establish seven years of peace. He will confirm a covenant for seven years. Your Antichrist is the Islamic Mahdi. And it's happening. And the Muslims are waiting for him and calling for him. And you're still oblivious to what God has been talking about. And God deals with Islam. In fact, Christ, when he comes down to earth, he's dealing with Muslim countries. The Lord comes riding in a swift cloud and is coming into Egypt, Muslim country. Isaiah 63, the Lord comes out of Edom with his garments sprinkled with blood. Edom, Arabia, Muslim country. Isaiah chapter 10, Lebanon shall fall by the mighty one. Lebanon, Hezbollah will be destroyed by the Messiah. Who's the mighty one? Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one. Habakkuk 3. Never heard of Habakkuk 3. Who's Habakkuk? <laughs> the Lord will come to fight Midian. Will come to fight Cush. Midian, Arabia, Sudan. When was the last time you had a Sunday school? Today we'll be discussing how the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come down and fight Egypt, fight Sudan, fight Arabia, fight Jordan, and fight. Nowhere. Because we want to believe in a teddy bear Jesus. I'm glad the pastor talked about that in his prayer. I heard him. The manger, no, 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 no. That's before. He came as a teddy bear Jesus, sure. Now he comes back. The bear grew. It's coming back as a grizzly bear. Forget the teddy bear Jesus and think of the grizzly bear Jesus. Two minutes before detonation. It's very difficult for me to speak at a church, you know, I open the... To turn the button on, everybody runs. <laughs> Thus, verse 39 and I close. Just three verses from the rich Bible. Three verses. How about the rest of it? How about the thousands of verses? I only have two 45-minute sessions. I can have two 45-month sessions. I will never finish studying how rich the Bible is. Verse 39, thus he, who's he, the Antichrist, shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god. Wow. 
which he shall acknowledge this foreign God and advance its glory, that glory of that foreign God that's a God of war, doesn't like women, and is a God of war. How many times has his God is mentioned in just two verses? Many times, four times. The God of the Antichrist. That is amazing. Now, I have two questions for you. I love to ask questions Jesus style. Asking questions Jesus style is a checkmate question. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses. If he declares war against the strongest fortresses, the strongest military might in the world. That means, number one, is the Antichrist the strongest military might? Yes or no? No. Who said that? I said that. The Bible said that. Daniel said that. He's not the strongest military might in the world. Why did you make him the most powerful man on earth? Because of your wishful thinking. They keep telling me that the Antichrist must come from the West because we're the strongest nations in the world. It must come from us. Why are you dying to be Antichrist? You're not Antichrist. You should act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god. Second question, if he acts the strongest, against the strongest fortress of the foreign god, is he atheist? No. Advance its glory through warfare. He will advance this deity of his through warfare. Have you heard of jihad lately? The Antichrist of the Bible is different than the Antichrist of tradition. Let the Bible read to you, don't read into it, and you'll get it. If you are the strongest fortresses today, what should your mission be as Americans reading these things? Number one, to rescue your own nation, to become patriots, to love this country, to understand that God is very nationalistic. If God is nationalistic, why are you not proud Americans? It's biblical. It is very biblical to be a proud American. God wanted us to be nationalistic. And he made us the strongest nation in the world for a reason. Oh, well, Wally, then he must destroy the strongest nation in the world. Uh, what, what makes you say that? Well, we must conclude, shut up! <laughs> it's not correct. I will show you what the Bible says, what he does with the strongest nations in the world in the next session. And you will see what America will be doing when Christ comes again. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that's the evidence, only three. I will adjourn and we'll come back later. Thank you very much and God bless. Take about 10 minutes, go to the book table. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, ladies. Every time I come around, don't worry, all of a sudden people start saying about the line of Judah and things change and fused. And the pastor was talking about America. I love it. But Turkey, Turkey? Thanksgiving's past. We're heading into Christmas. Turkey? Do you know the Bible? Okay. I know many of you are saying, well, wait a minute. Isn't the Bible talking about Rome? They talk about Rome the same way that they say, well, you know, he comes riding on a horse versus the donkey. It's Rome, not Turkey. Okay, that doesn't make a difference. It should make a big difference. Do you know Rome is mentioned 16 times in the Bible? Do you know how many times God destroyed Rome in the Bible? Can somebody tell me? How many references of the destruction of Rome in the Bible? Literally, by name. God destroys Rome. The burden against Rome. How many times in the Bible? Zero. And everybody's talking about Rome. There isn't a single mention in the Bible about Rome in destruction. Simply the travels of the apostles, this and that. But what about the burden against Arabia? What about the destruction of Arabia? It's all over the Bible. How often is it discussed? Never. You ever wonder why? Even Christ comes to fight in Arabia. Well, that shouldn't matter to you because you don't know it. And since you don't know it, 
And God should, you know, be a little westernized and kowtow to the western necessities of lack of understanding of biblical text or geography. Then he should adjust his word to fit everybody else's needs. Or should he keep his word and adjust you to his needs? Which one is it? The latter. The latter. Then, <laughs> Antichrist. Keep going in Daniel 11. Just take a few verses. 42, verse 42. He will come. He will, Egypt will be just taken away. He will defeat Egypt. He will defeat Sudan. And he will defeat Libya, which is North Africa, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania, all Islamic. All these nations, the Bible says, will follow him, the Antichrist, in submission. Can you imagine Egypt, how many millions? Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania, Sudan. All these hundreds of millions of Muslim hordes. And they tell me the Antichrist is a homosexual Westerner who comes from either France or Germany. Pastor Hagee says that. I don't agree with him at all. He comes from, he's either a Frenchman or German. Do you know why they say French or German? I'll tell you why. They think he's German because it says, in, remember the verse I shared with you? Pergamus, thou art the seat of Satan. Because there's an altar called the altar of Pergamus. And it was removed in the, uh, and taken to a museum in Hamburg, Germany. So they assumed that God transferred the seat of Satan from Turkey to Germany. But it's not talking about that altar. It's talking about the city itself. Pergamon, thou art the seat of Satan. So that's why he must be German. He must be French. I don't know why they chose the French or the Italians. I can imagine Egypt... And Sudan and Libya follows the Antichrist in submission. Hallelujah, hail the Antichrist in submission. Can you imagine if he's a French homosexual? <laughs> speaking to hundreds of millions of these Muslim hordes. What do you think he's going to tell them? Tell me. <laughs> and San Francisco style, they're just going to run right after him. <laughs> you know? Does that make any sense to you? He's not homosexual. He does not honor that desire of woman. Now if it says he does not desire women, maybe you'll be suspicious he's homosexual. But he does not honor the desire of women. He doesn't honor women's desires. Not he doesn't desire women. How much did the the make a difference? Just the the. T-H-E, the. You skip through the the and you think you got it. No. Don't remove the the. You know, sometimes I give lessons for hours on one word in the Bible, how big difference it makes. Just one word. They ignore those words. Open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 28, and let's see what God does to the Antichrist. Do you know, when Revelation tells you, about the beast, the false prophet, the nations that comes with the Antichrist, it says they're cast into the lake of fire. And you seem to go on a tangent interpreting that to be European Union and whatever. You know the Bible tells you what nations they are, literally by name. Do you know everything in Revelation, the supposedly mysterious book filled with allegories? Do you know that all these allegories are interpreted for you and given to you what they mean, literally, verse by verse? In the Bible itself? Americans have a problem. They say, we're going to study prophecy. Oh, well, he's going to talk about the book of Revelation. No. Why do you start at the end of the book? Why don't you start at the beginning of the book? Go to the beginning. Genesis, the woman issue, the whole thing, the nations, God, and what he does, and how important he's nationalistic, and... It goes on to all these other things. And he enters into the prophets, the minor prophets. The minor prophets will be the major prophets, trust me. In Ezekiel 28, he tells us about the Antichrist. Look what it says. It talks about him. He sits in the seat of God. Yet you are a man and not a God in verse 2. The Bible calls him right there in verse 2, the prince of Lebanon, the prince of Tyre. When was the last time you studied about the Antichrist being called the prince of Lebanon? Where is Lebanon? Middle East. He's called the Assyrian. 
He comes from the regions of Assyria. Syria, Iraq, Turkey was part of Assyria too. He's called Pharaoh of Egypt. He's never once called the king of Rome. He's called Pharaoh of Egypt, Muslim country. He's a ruler of a Muslim land. King of Babylon, Iraq, Arabia. And then he goes on. He calls him Prince of Lebanon. You're a God, and a man, not a God. Then he goes to talk about him. In verse 7, he says, he says, Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you. I thought the Antichrist rules the entire globe. That's what they teach you. You know, sort of he sings a song. I got the whole world in my hand. I got the whole wide world in my hand. He's got the whole globe in his hand. Then who are these strangers who comes against him? There are nations that won't stand with him. That will go against him. Because Americans think that the Antichrist rules the entire globe. And since it says in Zechariah, and all the nations of the earth will come against Jerusalem, it's every nation on the earth. Do you know, did you know that in every nation on the earth, in the Bible, never meant every age nation on the globe. The earth, Eretz, doesn't mean the globe, the land, and all the nations in the land surrounding Israel. Alexander the Great, his wings hovered through the whole earth. Alexander the Great never conquered even all of India. He never conquered Europe. He had a certain land. Solomon, his wisdom, went through the whole earth. Did the Mayans come here, the wisdom of Solomon? No. Oh, the Bible can, then the Bible must not be telling the truth. No. You must not be understanding what Eastern language is. It's written in Eastern language. It's an Eastern book. It's understood by Eastern minds. A lot simpler for us in the East to know. Oh, but we know what that means. <laughs> to you? Oh, no. We interpret it verbatim from the English to the English. It's from Hebrew to the English. You know, Nebuchadnezzar issued a decree to every nation, tribe, and tongue on the face of the earth. They all must come and worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Did every nation on the earth come and worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? No. He's a decree to every nation, tribe, and tongue on the face of the earth. Wow, that seems to be conclusive. The Chinese will come. No. I can go through verses, all the verses in the Bible are that way. Never until global except the flood. It said it was a global, mabul, global. A full global flood of the whole earth. That's different. And it says it there, you know. Who are these strangers who come against him if he rules the whole world? If he, you know, what does the Bible tell us? Ten toes. It doesn't seem to be the whole, the whole world is not ten nations, ten kings. Ten toes, ten horns, remember that? The ten horns are ten kings. Are the world ten kings? In fact, three will be plucked out of the root. Seven kings will remain. Christ comes with seven nations. God will raise seven shepherds. Micah 5, you'll never learn that anywhere. No books. They don't talk about it. It's in the Bible. Christ will lead seven shepherds. Seven shepherds versus seven evil shepherds. It's a battle. Like World War III, like World War II. You got allies here, and you got the enemy there. The forces of darkness. And then God will raise seven leaders from the forces of light. But Walid, how could God choose America? America is a very sinful nation. Yes. But let me tell you the difference that you don't understand. Here's the difference. Germany. Could God choose Germany to be part of his nations? Yes. But wait a minute. They killed six million Jews. Let me ask you this question. Had Hitler repented moments before he died? Not committing suicide. Let's assume the Allies killed him. Had he repented, would God forgive him? Yes. Kill six million Jews. There's nothing God cannot forgive. Nothing. What happened? Germany repented. Today, if you go to Germany, you say, well, I'm a Holocaust denier. I'd like to give a sermon on why the Holocaust never happened. You know what happens? They throw your butt in jail. <laughs> it is illegal today to deny the Holocaust in Germany. That's how they're so strong about this. We never have this darkness come into our country again. Turkey, Armenian genocide. Do you know the majority of Christians throughout history were killed by Turks? 
the Ottoman Empire killed more Christians. You can forget the Roman Empire. You can forget any empire. In the, you can forget any empire in history combined. No one killed more Christians than Islam. You don't have a month to go over it. The Church of Smyrna and the Bible, who killed them? Muslims. In 1900s. If you go to Turkey today, I would like to discuss the Armenian Genocide. I would like the Turks to confess the Armenian Genocide. What happens to you? You go to jail. That, if you deny the Holocaust, you go to jail. That, if you confess their Holocaust, you go to jail. Which one of the two is in God's favor? God seeks what? Confession, repentance. Confession. He wants confession. We are a people that confesses our sins over confess. Ask an American, you know, what do you think about the conquistadors? Bad! Some things the conquistadors did was good. They removed Mayan worship from Mexico. They were plucking heads and plucking hearts from pyramids. They got rid of that crap and they introduced Christianity. That's good. Crusades, they burned Jews. Yes. Crusades did all kinds of bad things. We over confess the Crusades. Crusades equals bad. But everything the Crusades was did was bad. There's a lot of things the Crusades did was good. They came to liberate Christendom from Islam, the yoke of Islam. Yes, they made a mistake. Many of them made mistakes in Jerusalem. That's true, but they confessed it. The Catholic Church confessed all this stuff. Now, I'm not here to speak Catholicism. Don't start getting on me because I said the Pope repented from that. That means I am coming to preach about the Catholic Church. I'm not. In fact, I'm not coming to preach about the Protestant Church either. Well, the Catholics have idols in their churches. So do you. Why? Wait a minute. Why? How do we do that? Well, they got the big statues in their church. You got them under the Christmas trees. You know, all big statues are bad. The little ones are okay. <laughs> now, I'm not against Christmas trees. I'm against these things. Don't get me wrong. You can have all the Christmas trees you want. Behold, verse 7, look what it says, I will bring strangers against you, against the Antichrist. The most terrible of the nations, the most powerful nations, terrible doesn't mean awful, ugly. Biblical terrible, terrible in battle. Always when it says nations that are terrible in battle. They are terrible in battle. The most terrible of the nations, the most powerful military might in the world, the ones that just kind of nuke, 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 those are the kind of, that nations, God's going to bring them against the Antichrist. There it is. And they, excuse me, who's that? They, who's the they? Those nations. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom. They, those nations, will come against you. There are nations that come against the Antichrist. There's no way you can refute it. There's no way you can convince anybody who's sound-minded, who reads the Bible, that the Antichrist rules every country in the world. He doesn't. These other nations comes against him, and guess what? Those nations defeat him. Because they tell me, oh, he must defeat America. No, that's not what it says. Look what it says, verse 8. They, those nations, those powerful nations, shall throw you down into the pit. Into the lake of fire. Is that busting your bubble? That to me, as the pastor said, I heard him, good news. That to me is good news. That to me is edifying of the church in America. That edifies. The other message destroys. You know how you know devils lie? It's destructive. It destroys the church. To say, oh, that's it. You're going to just leave in rapture and everything else. You have nothing else to do. Pack up, get ready, get your garbanzo beans ready, and you're going to, you know, your pinto beans or whatever, and you're just going to get out of here. You know, I worry. Many times I get to go to my wife and say, honey, I think, I think the world's going to end. And, 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 and I'm a war war. I'm a war by nature. I've lived in the Middle East, many wars. Because six days war, there was no food. So I packed my pantry with garbanzo beans. We live on garbanzo beans in the Middle East. We eat garbanzo beans. We make falafels and hummus and all that stuff. And since my wife is Mexican, we got a lot of pinto beans galore. 
packed up in the pantry. Enough for seven years, just in case the pre-tribbers are wrong. <laughs> and many times I look at my pantry and go like, what am I afraid of? I go to churches and I preach that God is in control. And now I have my pantry that I think I'm in control. I'm a hypocrite. Confession is the beginning of healing. <laughs> and I'm the first confessor that I'm a sinner. It's my human nature. It's that way we are. We always think, you know, bean counters. <laughs> and things pass. And the garbanzos are rotting. <laughs> and the wheat is rotting. I know, I said, how long will it last? Let me know. It doesn't last for 20 years. What am I going to do? Y2K comes, and oh, we're buying all these foods and all that stuff. Y2K is coming. I told my wife, Y2K came. I was a computer programmer. I emptied the fridge. There was no food in the house at all. And all of my friends, oh, Y2K, I gotta buy food, I gotta dried food, dehydrated, mehydrated, Chuck Missler said this and that. Excuse me. Chuck Missler's wrong. Guess what? He was wrong. I just ran into him a month ago. I was with him in Australia. The whole time in Australia, I was telling him how wrong he was all the time. <laughs> and he smiled back at me. He's a very gracious guy. I love the guy. He's a good guy. He's not a bad guy. He's a good scholar of the Bible. But it's the human fear that causes us to think that way. We forget that God is in control. God's in control. We are on the right side, not the wrong side. The other guys are the one on the wrong side. It's the Muslims. It's the fallen church called Islam. We got it right. Trinity. They got it wrong. Man. Ask any Muslim. What do they believe? The anti-Trinity. The first thing. They condemn you for Trinity. God's in control. They. Verse 8. They shall throw you down into the pit. Don't ever forget that verse. Jot it in your mind for the rest of your life. Because I might die on the way home. And then it continues to tell you what nations they are. One after the other. It tells you who the Antichrist is. Verse 12. It says, you were the cherub. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Who was in Eden, the garden of God? No. Adam and Steve. If I was Adam and Steve, tell me, where in the world did we come from? Pastor, you're not that good looking to me. I don't know what your wife sees in you. In fact, I don't know what my wife sees in me. I think both of us can never figure out why our wife sees anything about us. We take a shower, we look in front of the mirror, and we look at ourselves. We are very ugly. Forget about the six abs. That's ugly too to us. Can you imagine guys seeing your wife with six abs? What is the word voluptuous comes from? We like voluptuous. They like six abs. I can't explain why they like six abs, but I can explain why we like voluptuous. <laughs> Lust of the flesh. God planted us that way. If you think that six abs is cute and you're a male, God didn't intend it to be that way. Something is wrong. Get consultation. No, what was there is Adam and Eve, Steve. <laughs> that it tells us, it's not about Adam and Eve. It tells us, in verse 14, you were in the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were in the holy mountain of God. You were perfect in your ways. Wow, who's that? You have sinned. You were the covering cherub. Ah, that's an angelic being, not a man. Yet it says... He is a man and not a God. Wow, how could the angelic being be a man? There is a problem in the Bible. No, there's a problem with you and me, if we understand that to be that way. When can an angel be a man? Every time you read in the Bible, an angel being a man, anti-Christ. The possession. Isaiah 14, in fact, the five eyes. I will ascend to heaven. I will be like the most high God. I, I, I. Yet it goes on to say, yet you are a man and not a God. Excuse me, most Westerners, when they look at the five eyes, that's the, they say that's the rebellion of Lucifer. 
And I was asked a question. My question is always Jesus style. I said, if that's the rebellion of Lucifer in heaven, why is he called, you are a man and not a God? Antichrist. I have ascended into heaven. Boy, as a Muslim, when I read that, I knew that I was on the wrong side. You don't get it because you were never Muslim. You were never on the other side. I, have, I will ascend to heaven. Muhammad claimed to have ascended into heaven. Ask a Muslim. Do you believe Muhammad ascended to heaven? They call it Al-Isra' wal miraj One of the main themes of Islam that Muhammad ascended to heaven. Muhammad says that the Mahdi comes. The Mahdi will bring seven years of peace. The Mahdi will have my spirit in him. Who's that spirit that was in Muhammad that will be also in the Mahdi? The claim to ascend to heaven? Lucifer. In fact, next time Muslims tell you, you worship Jesus who's a man, and that's blasphemy in Islam. We worship God straightforward. Not true. You worship God, they worship a man. Oh, well, we don't worship Muhammad. What you claim doesn't mean nothing to God. Because to a Muslim, you ask him the following questions. Number one, why is he called Muhammad? What does that mean? Muhammad means the praised one. How could you call any man on earth the praised one unless you've deified him? He's called, given in the Quran, the title Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud, the glorious one. How could you call any man the glorious one? You also claim as a Muslim that Muhammad was created before Adam. Jesus said before Adam was, I am. Because he was God. Are you claiming Muhammad was before Adam? That's a major claim, my friend. Not only do you worship Muhammad, but you also worship the black stone even though you deny it. You bow to it several times a day. And then you say that it takes away your sins. You go around the seven times during the Hajj and you claim it takes away your sins. Who can take sin away but God? We believe God takes sin away. You believe a black stone takes sin away? It's black because it took the sins of the Muslims? You've deified an idol. Americans will come and tell me, but Walid, why are you talking about the black stone? When is the black stone in the Bible? Excuse me. Everything about Islam is in the Bible. Acts chapter 19, verse 35. Do not worship Artemis and her image that fell from Zeus. You read that and you go like, ah, big deal. Continue. Stop. Ah. The image of Artemis was a meteor, a black stone that they worshipped in Ephesus. And the New Testament don't do this. Yet. The Bible calls that meteor, that black stone they worshipped in Ephesus, what? Image. An image. Why am I talking about an image all of a sudden? Here's why. They will worship the image of the beast. Revelation. They will bow to the image of the beast. Muslims do what? They bow to an image. A black stone. And if they refuse to bow to their image, the image of the beast... They'll have your head chopped off. That has been going on for a thousand some years with Islam who killed all the Christians by beheading for refusing to bow to the black stone in the Kaaba in Mecca and receive their Allah, their God. Fulfill the Bible to a T. This is why it says, I saw the martyrs that were beheaded in the name of Jesus. Once you see the Bible so true, historically, reality of today, once you turn the TV and you read the Bible, these countries matches what's in the Bible. Once you see all these things, what does that do to you? It confirms your faith. I'm on the right track, but you're going to get beheaded. So what? So what? Me and my wife and my kids, we have reviewed our beheading hundreds of times. We're ready. Every day we think we're going to get beheaded. Do you think we'll get beheaded tomorrow? Let's hope not. Let's have the joy of the day. If you think you're going to get beheaded every single day, guess what? When that comes, you're okay. You're peace with it. Jesus said, if you try to prolong your life, if you try to win your life, if you try, you will lose it. If you try to lose your life, you will gain it. 
It's the opposite. You need to start trying to lose your life, not by air gliding, stupid stuff. <laughs> I like to watch those programs. Me and my kids like to, oh, he broke his legs, great, praise God. <laughs> somebody else is suffering and somebody else is joy. Oh, my well, lady, can I have a sadistic spirit here to think about these guys air gliding and skiing from mountaintops falling? Yes, why would they go to a place where there's an avalanche to ski? Can't they go on a regular gondola like everybody else? Why, why, why? Daredevils and all that stuff. What for? Flipping the bike in the air. You're going to break your neck. And all these fools kind of like, you know. The world gets rid of them. That's it, fools, you know. That's a fool. What do you do with your life as a teenager? Going to those four wheels on a board. You know, stairs, fall and break your ankle. Have you broken your ankle for Christ? Have you broken your neck because they chopped your head off because you're preaching the gospel in Pakistan? That's different. That I will do something about. But those fools are fools. Then it continues to talk about all these nations. Chapter 30 of Ezekiel. I'm only sharing Three chapters, and not all the chapters, just four verses out of each chapter just to show you the richness of how God talked about what we live in today. Chapter 30 of Ezekiel. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles. The time of the Gentiles, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord's Christ is on earth fighting. Why am I saying Christ fights in the day of the Lord? Why is that so crucial? Here's, a, here's why it's so crucial. Christ comes and fights in the day of the Lord, and all the nations he fights are Islamic. Now, the people who've been writing books the last 30 years, he used the Antichrist, the Pope is the harlot, and all these things that you're so used to, they got a problem. Because they see the rise of Islam. All of them, by the way, confess that Islam plays a role in end times. All of them. Not one of them doesn't confess that. But they still haven't came with a complete confession. The Islam plays the major role of end times, period. Not just a major role. So what do they say? They say, well, our books are right. Here's what must happen. The Islamic threat must be destroyed before Christ comes. And before the Antichrist appears on earth, Islam must be destroyed. Why? Because if Islam is destroyed when Christ is on earth, guess what? Then Islam is the Antichrist system. You, are you with me or am I losing you? I get, I get a little technical, a little complex, but you need to understand this. So you talk to Hal Lindsay and Hal Lindsay says, well, uh, the day of the Lord. Because remember, the day of the Lord here, God is dealing with what? Muslim countries, every single one of them. Verse 5, he deals with Ethiopia, Kush, Sudan. He deals with Libya. He deals with Lydia. You know where Lydia is? Where's Lydia? Speak up. No one knows where Lydia is. You're in trouble. Where's Lydia? Libya is in Africa. Not Lydia. Libya is not Lydia. Lydia. Where's Lydia? Anybody? The women? The women are smarter than the men everywhere. Any woman? Honey, where's Lydia? Where's Lydia? Where? Where, honey? Turkey. It's because I've been brainwashing you for so many years. Working. Now, instead of waking my wife up 2 o'clock in the morning to throw her on the mattress, you know what's been happening since I became Christian? I woke her up still 2 o'clock in the morning. I'll be walking around the bedroom. Uh, she's upstairs and I'm down. Says, honey, honey, I found it. I found it. Turkey. Oh, well, siesta, no, not right now, I'm going to sleep. I'm trying to go Mimi. I was bugging her every night. She goes from one bug to the different kind of a bug. He's still a bug. So she nicknamed me Bug. Now I'm discovering nuggets. Lydia is in Turkey. Question. Why is Lydia dealt with on the day of the Lord if Islam is to be removed before the coming of the Antichrist? Remember, rule number one. 
when the Antichrist comes to, the, to, to, to this earth, I mean, he is possessed by the devil, when the Antichrist appears, there's no way Christ can come until the, un, unless the Antichrist is on earth first. Why? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. They will tell you, oh, the Lord is coming, this and that. Don't believe it. The man of sin must be revealed. And he sits in the temple of God. Then Christ will come. So, when the Antichrist is on earth, okay, on the day of the Lord, when Christ comes, Antichrist must be on earth. So, what does Hal Lindsay do with the day of the Lord? He's dealing with Muslim nations on the day of the Lord. Well, the day of the Lord must be the entire seven years. The entire seven years is the day of the Lord. He just kind of did some little gymnastics there. Well, a day to the Lord is a thousand years. Why can't it be seven years? Okay, Mr. Lindsay, here's the question. It says in the Bible that the sun and the moon will not give any light before the dreadful day of the Lord. Are you saying that the sun will turn off before the seven-year peace treaty? You can't. The sun will turn off when Christ comes to earth. He's the light of the world. See what happens? It becomes major problems. The scripture becomes just gymnastic stuff. Stay away from gymnastics. Be very meticulous. And here God is dealing with Turkey, with North Africa, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania, and with Sudan. Africa? Why? North Africa. You know how much, you know, people don't talk about Africa much. Americans, if you talk about Islam, say, oh, it's the fastest growing religion. False myth. There's so many myths. Islam is not the fastest growing faith. Christianity is. The fastest growing faith is Christianity, not Islam. Africa used to be two-thirds Muslim. Today, Africa is two-thirds Christian. No one talks about it in the church because it's Africa. Who cares about Africa? God is all concentrated on Europe and the West. False. He's focused on Africa. He's bringing two-thirds of Africa to the faith. Two-thirds. Imagine. That's very edifying. We're winning. We don't talk about those victories. We keep talking about our losses. Myth. Islam is a religion. No. If Islam is a religion, Islam, why is Islam a constitutional government? Sharia. What's Sharia? Sharia law? What's that? Law is not religion. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, said, Al Islam din wa dawla. Islam is a religion and a state. Christianity is not a religion and a state. We leave the state alone. Render unto the state what belongs to the state and unto God what belongs to God. Americans are waiting for a one world religion, one world government. Go no further. Islam is a one world religion, one world government, one world state. Islam is about unifying the world under one language. I always asked myself, right from Genesis as a Muslim when I read the Bible. I said, why is it that God changed the languages? Why? Why is the Christian God multilingual? Our God is single language, Arabic. Do you know there isn't a single mosque on earth? Even though the country doesn't speak Arabic, will always worship Allah in only one language, the Arabic language. Did you know that? Afghans don't speak Arabic, they pray to Allah in Arabic. Indonesians, all of them. And music is forbidden in Islam. Why? Do you know why music is forbidden in Islam? Because the devil wants to take away joy. Period. Uh, the toughest time I had when I walked into the church, there was music. The Muslim music, ah, fale, cut the beat. Uh, I loved it. Music is great. God has seven chords for the instrumental music song. Seven is the holy number. In fact, six days war was on the seventh day God rested. Six days war. Joshua, six days war. On the seventh day, if you read the Bible very carefully, meticulously like we do, it says on the seventh day, the Israelites arose, went around the walls of Jericho seven times. <laughs> Walls fell and they declared the state of Israel. On the seventh day, on the dawn, it says, in the morning before the sun came up. The seventh day haven't commenced yet. Six days and then they had won the battle. That was in 1967. I was there. I saw it with my very own eyes. 
If I see it with my very own eyes, do you think somebody's going to convince me that the Bible isn't true? The Bible is, can be studied scientifically with a logical mind. There is no other manuscript of any other religion that can be studied with a logical mind. They're all about, if you feel in your heart that Joseph Smith is God, or is a prophet, then you will believe. No, my heart is wicked. I don't trust my heart. My heart is wicked. The heart of man is utterly wicked. We imagine. In other words, the way the devil works and the way that God works. And this is what my son Theodore says. This is what he wrote for God or for tyranny. He says the way the devil works is he empowers people to believe in fantasy. Go to the bookstores. Myth, all of it. You want to read books about myth? It's all about, what was these books? Fiction. Fiction, 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 fiction. Religion. That's even worse than the fiction. I go to the religious section. Rubbish, 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 rubbish. There's nothing left. Walk away. Fiction. Fantasy. Nazism is a fantasy. The Aryan race is a fantasy. Islam ruling the globe, fantasy. Communism is a fantasy. There is only two systems. Capitalism or communism. There's no other third system. Is that amazing or what? Capitalism, work. You work, you gain. Socialism, they work, I lay down. There's only two systems. One's destructive, one is not. Make a choice. America worked. Russia didn't. It failed. This succeeds. You make a choice. It's that simple. There's only two systems. Socialism depends on a fantasy that we all can be fair. That we all, you know, share the wealth. What do you want me to share? Why should I share my wealth? What do you want me to share? My wife too? Share everything. Share my kids. No, I'm not going to share. And if you walk through my window at night, I'm going to take the shotgun, shoot you full of holes, and go back to sleep and worry about my wife cleaning the mess in the morning. <laughs> I believe in the GGC, God, gun, and country. <laughs> I was transformed from a terrorist to a fundamentalist Bible-thumping Christian and a patriot, American, with an accent. All the nations that God is with. On the day of the Lord, when he takes the devil, the Antichrist, puts him into the pit. All of them are Islamic. It tells you right there the interpretation of Revelation. And then it continues to tell you, Pharaoh of Egypt, Muslim country. And then it goes on to say, he will send them in the depths of the earth. And he says, you have down, went down to hell. Verse 15, chapter 31. God doesn't miss words. You go down to hell. I cast more than I covered. This is the Antichrist. He talks about how the Antichrist will receive him. And how the Lebanese will cry for him. You are into the pit, 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 pit. Just read the word pit in the Bible, you'll get it. And look at verse 22 of chapter 32. Verse 22 of 32. Chapter 32 of Ezekiel, verse 22. Assyria is there and all her company. Assyria, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, this is Assyria. Verse 23. Her graves are set in the recess of the pit. There's that pit again. Pit in the pit, in the pit, in the pit. Search the word pit and you'll get it. Just one word in the Bible, and you'll get it. All the nations that goes into hell. Verse 24, there is Elam and all her multitude, all around her graves. Who is Elam? Who is Elam? Elam? Anybody? Who? Syria, no? Now that was very smart, you know. What, what's wrong with guessing? No? Where is Elam? It's about 20 nations in the Bible. Figure them out. It's in God's war and terror. In my book, all that stuff is explained to you in detail. From the Genesis of the Revelation. All these things. If you read God's war on terror, you won't be the same. Trust me. There's a curse and a blessing. The curse, the blessing is that you will know the Bible, the prophetic word, so well... That when you watch TV every day, you'll know exactly what in the world's going on. The curse is you have to do something about it. 
That's the curse. And let me warn you. Elam is Iran. Persia. Into the pit. There is Meshech and Tubal. Meshech and Tubal is not Moscow and Tubolsk. It's Mushki and Tubalani in Turkey. Look at the Bible maps. You can go to the Unger Bible Dictionary, the Moody Bible, Bible Lands, the Oxford Bible Dictionary, the Encyclopedia of Bible Lands. All of them show Meshech Tubal is in Turkey. All of them. They're all correct. Then it goes on. Verse 29, there is Edom and all her kings, plural. Edom is in Arabia, Jordan, Dubai, Bahrain, all the kings of the Arabs, all these kings, plural, into the pit, into the pit. All Muslim. Arabia is in the Bible. In fact, even in Galatians chapter 4, the war will be between the children of Sarah, the free woman, and the children of Hagar, the bondwoman, the children of Sarah that comes in from Jerusalem, which is still in sin, and the children of Hagar, that is Sinai in Arabia. Excuse me, is Arabia there by there by accident? What does sin mean anyway? Sinai, Sinai, sin means the moon god. Sin, the moon god. In fact, is, did you know Allah is in the Bible? Sanballat, remember Sanballat, Tubya Gashem? The Arabs came and harassed the Jews about building the temple. One of them is Sanballat. Sin bin Alat. Sin, the moon god, son of Alat. Alat is a Semitic word, Arabic word. The feminine root of Allah is Alat. They used to worship Alat. The female deity who is the daughter of Allah. Allah is Baal. No question about it. Look at uh, Arthur Jeffrey, one of the greatest scholars in Islam. He says, the worship of Allah is the same as the worship of Baal, who had the three consorts. Baal had three consorts. Allah of Islam, pre-Islam in Arabia, had three consorts. Alat, Manat, and Al-Uzza. He goes on. All these countries are Islamic. Every single country in the Bible. Then you go to 339, you go to Isaiah, you go to Amos, you go to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, you go to Obadiah. All the nations is about a one battle between Christ and Muslim countries. No, Helens is wrong about that issue. Because even if he wants to make that argument, the day of the Lord is uh, seven years then why is it that in every single verse in the Bible where Christ fights, he fights, and the nations he mentions by name, every single one is Islamic. Forget that God said the burden against Arabia, the burden against this and that. Think about the verses where Christ is on earth. It's a compelling argument. It's DNA, no question about it. In fact, Iran will blow up Saudi Arabia. What's this guy talking about? Iran? No, Iran, not Iran. You ran nowhere. It's not Iraq. You racked nothing and you ran nowhere. It's Iraq. Babylon. Isaiah chapter 21. Jacob, you're not giving me the time, so I'm still going. I'm not going. I'm going to keep going all night long till you give me that time sheet. Once you see the five minutes. Before detonation, then I begin to stop because it's my life at jeopardy. Chapter 21, the burden against the wilderness of the sea, the desert of the sea. The desert of the sea. It's a desert in the middle of oceanic waters. It's in Arabia. Even John, when the angel took him to the desert, and the angel took me to the wilderness, to the desert, there he showed me a woman riding on a beast, excuse me, in a desert and then the angel tells him, John, why do you wonder? I will tell you what the woman is. The woman is a city, it's a state, in the middle of a desert. That can't be lush Rome. In fact, in fact, just to give you DNA evidence in which you will become tonight serious scholars of prophecy, not just students, scholars. Babylon is destroyed. Jeremiah 49, 50, 51. Remember in Revelation it says, and I heard the noise of its destruction, you know. And the, the Alas, Alas, the great city. Shipmasters, ships in the sea. Weep and wail when the city is destroyed. Alas, Alas, that great city. They are in the sea. They're looking at it, the city, the place, the, the state, the destruction of the place. Far off, it says, far off. The this, this city is not right on the beach, it's far off from the beach. And they're sitting there wailing, Alas, Alas, that great city. 
And it tells us the interpretation of that in Jeremiah 49, 50 and 51. The destruction of this Babylon. And I heard the noise of her destruction at the Red Sea. Red Sea? Hello? Geographic location. DNA evidence. You ignored all the DNA evidence. And you focused on all the allegoric verses in Revelation. And you isolated Revelation by itself. And you caused yourself to be confused. And you forgot Jeremiah the prophet. Even Babylon's destruction. That great city, Babylon. Babylon is fallen, is fallen in Revelation. Do you know Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is already interpreted for you where it is? God did not speak in secret for the believers. God spoke in secret from the world. The fools. Look at chapter 21 of Isaiah. The burden against the desert. The woman is surrounded by many oceanic waters. Waters is also symbolic of multitudes, nations, different tribes, and different tongues. Islam compromises of different tribes, nations, and tongues. Different languages from all sects, all colors, and all origins. No question about it. Now, look at verse 9. Then he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Excuse me? Same as in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. Same as in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. Read it. Then in verse 11 it says the burden against Dumma. Where is Dumma? Dumma al-Jandal. That is in Saudi Arabia. No one can deny it. All scholars agree. Dumma is in Saudi Arabia. It's called Dumma al-Jandal. I was a Middle Easterner. I know where Dumma is. And look at verse 13. The burden against Arabia. Excuse me? The burden against Arabia. Does that need an interpretation? Does it? Arabia is Arabia. No Rome. Who destroys it? Arise, O Elam. Elam, verse 2. Arise, go up, O Elam. Go up, O Iran. Destroy it. I've been talking about this for so many years. Deaf ears. I was made to be a liar. I was made to be a fraud. I was made to be all these things. WikiLeaks, just the other day. What? Do you know what they found in WikiLeaks? Saudi Arabia is pleading with the West, with America, please destroy Iran, because Iran is going to destroy us. Yeah. No one now can deny it. Iran is going to destroy Saudi Arabia. Where did I get that from? I stole it from the Bible. I looked all over for a copyright and I said, what a treasure. I'm just going to simply put it in a book and sell it. You can't blame me, I'm from the Middle East. <laughs> Iran will destroy Arabia with a nuke. Because even the oil, even the burning of the Arab oil is in the Bible, Isaiah 34. So much there is in the Bible that people don't read, they don't teach. That's why I wrote God's War on Terror. So finally people can see it firsthand. Where it's in the Bible, everything. It will be nuked. There will be nuclear war. Tongues will melt in their mouths. Their eyes will melt as they stand up still alive. Boof, nukes. Pillars of smoke, the book of Joel. Pillars of smoke, mushroom clouds. It's very clear. Why will Arabia be nuked? Why will it be destroyed? Because Arabia is where this heresy came from. Arabia is the focus of Islam. Arabia is where Satan set up his idol and where everybody is bowing down to that image. Arabia disseminated the cult of Islam all throughout the globe. The Arabia is guilty. That's the harlot. This is where the Islamic source came from. It must be destroyed. It will burn. It's so clear. Arabia will be destroyed by Iran. It's in the Bible. In fact, do you know how many gentlemen's bet I had? Chuck Missler, a couple of years ago, I said, I, he said, this going to just, Israel is going to attack Iran by another month. No! I was right, he was wrong. They were all wrong. It's not because I'm a genius, it's because I got it from the Bible. Why must Arabia be destroyed by Islam itself? Why must, how can the Muslims destroy their holy place? For your theory that Rome is the harlot, then Italy and Spain and uh, France must burn the Vatican. Not going to happen. 
Because the Bible says the beast will burn the harlot city. Their holy place, they will burn it. Unfathomable. How many of you were here in the first Gulf War? First Gulf War. Didn't Saddam Hussein send Scud missiles at Saudi Arabia? No Muslim made a peep. Saudi Arabia is hated. Why? Because she lives in luxury. The Bible says that she lives in luxury. Luxury. Abundance of her wealth. It controls the world with her spiritual lies. So amazing. Saudi Arabia, all the kings of the earth slept with her. Even President Bush slept with Saudi Arabia. He said, we all worship the same God to please the Arabs. Do we worship the same God, Pastor? If we worship the same God, then why did I have to convert? Faisal Abdul Rauf, the man behind the ground zero mass, says we all worship the same God. I wrote him a letter, open letter in the media. I said, Mr. Abdul Rauf, we all worship the same God. Okay. I greet you in the name of my God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, my God, and yours, right? If he says right, I've had myself a convert. If he says wrong, then he's been proven to be a liar. Learn how to ask questions Jesus style. Learn from Jesus how to ask questions and how to confound the world. How to put them in the spot. You can learn that from Jesus. I simply opened the Bible. I read it. And I believed. I was blind. And now I can see. And you know what? Now you also can see. God doesn't want us to live in blindness. He's not of the dark. He's of the light. He's not on the losing side. He is in the winning side, and anyone who follows him will be victorious with him. So if you know the truth, and the truth sets you free, what are you doing about your life? What are you doing about your time? Aim high. You can change the world. Hey guys, that was... Uh very interesting. I, I, I listen to him quite often and I've heard this one so often, but it never amazes me. And I always learn a little bit more from it the more I listen. And he's right. We have a tendency to start at the back of the book versus going to the front of the book where it actually will tell you, you know, what the, you know, what areas are really against Christ and against uh, God's people. I mean, it, it, it just it just breaks it down. And with all of the stuff that's going on in the Middle East right now, the things that are going on in Turkey right now, the things that are going on with Israel right now, you got Russia doing its thing, all these things coming into play. I'm going to tell you something, guys. It's time to stop playing games. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, you have if you haven't accepted him as your Lord and personal Savior, I advise you to do so now. He's coming, and he's coming quickly. No man knows when the Son of Man will show up. Nobody knows when Jesus is going to show up, but one thing's for sure is he's going to show up. And you need to get yourself together. We all have to stand before God and give an account of our lives. And if he does not have you written in the book of life, you are not going to make it in. You are going to be damned pretty much. Okay. Which means cursed. And you're going to be sent to the lake of fire. It's no need to go through that. Listen, all you have to do is accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal savior. You just need to believe. Believe that he is the son of God. Believe that God raised him from the dead. Believe that he's coming back again. Believe that he can forgive you of your sins, which he will. You just need to do that and repent. Repent just basically means changing your mind of your old ways. And you're not going to do that anymore. And you're going to then try to live according to God's word. Get yourself a Bible, not any Bible, a King James Bible. Get in the word. Start reading it as you read it. Ask God to reveal things to you so that you can learn the word. So you can put it in your heart in your mind, in your soul, in your spirit, so it can be hidden within your heart. Guys, we need to stop playing games. It's time to stop 
messing around. There's nothing in this world but death and destruction. Now, I'm not trying to scare anybody or cause anybody to really uh, think of this as being a fear tactic. This is just life and death. You prepare for everything else. Prepare for your eternal life. You already have a free gift out there for you that Jesus paid the price for. Why not accept the free gift of eternal life? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and start living for real. Because right now, if you're not saved, you're the walking dead. You truly are the walking dead. You don't even realize you're dead. You're dead in your spirit. You have no relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to get a relationship with him. You need to start walking and talking with him a little bit more. You need to start changing the way you do things. You need to start associating yourself with certain things and disassociating yourself with certain things. Come on, guys. It's time to stop playing games. Go ahead. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, get in touch with me. You can call me at 443-840-9997 and you can say, hey, Mary, I need a Bible. Give me your name and address. I will send it to you. Do you understand? I will send it to you for free. Free Bibles, guys. Free King James Version. That's the Bibles you need. Now, once you get the Bible, try to get yourself into a decent church. Not just any church. Not one with bells and whistles. I mean, you can get bells and whistles at an amusement park. But I'm talking about real fellowship, real real worship, and real prayer along with real teachings of God's Word. We need that. We need that. Make sure you have a shepherd that's willing to feed you real food, not artificial stuff. Okay, And you want one that's going to be concerned about your growth in Christ, not the growth in how many people are hitting their butts in the seat. That's not what it's about. It's about saving souls. This is a battle for souls. We're getting down to the wire. Satan is doing everything he possibly can to deflect and to deter and to turn away people from the true word of God and from Jesus himself. He knows his time is short. He know he already lost. He figured, okay, well, listen, if I already lost the battle and the war, I'm taking some people with me. And that's what he's doing. Guys, don't get caught up in the madness. Don't get caught up in the foolishness. Don't get caught up in the buffoonery. Don't get caught up in none of this garbage. It's time for us to go ahead and do what's right. It's time for us to get our lives tight. And it's time to go ahead and, and get ready because I'm going to tell you, he's coming. I can feel it. He's coming. I know you can feel it. It's in the air. This ain't no Phil Collins, it's in the air tonight thing. No, it's in the air. You can see it. It's around you. It's thick. It is thick. You can cut it with a knife. It's that thick. Stop playing around, guys, okay? All right, I love you guys, man. I don't want nobody to be lost. Shoot, I don't want to be lost. That's why I got saved. That's why I gave my life back to Christ, because I don't want that. I don't do well with pain. I don't do well. I'm not doing good with that. I, need, I mean, I get a paper cut and I'm upset. I mean, when I say upset, I don't like the pain. Now, you're going to turn around and you're going to want to go to hell and burn for all eternity? Oh, no. Oh, no. I mean, right now, it's too hot in my office. I'm getting ready to turn on the air. Oh, no. I, I can't take that type of heat. I just can't. They say if you can't take the heat, get out the kitchen. If you can't take hell, get out of it. All right? It's time to stop playing games. All right? Love you guys. I hope I will visit you next time on the next show. I hope you stay tuned in. Tell others about Next Chapter Radio. Also, check out my boy, Justin Fowle, on the Fourth Watch Radio. He also has a show every Thursday. You can catch his show at starting at 11 a.m., and he that's when he puts it up anyway. You can catch very insightful, very educational, very, I'm telling you, spiritual Shows You're going to get fed on that one, too. He has some great guests on his show. He has Ellie Marzulli, Doc Marquis. He also has Tom. I think he has Tom Horner. I know he's had Chris Putnam on. I mean, these he put he really has some excellent guests on his shows. Uh, we're also going to be getting guests, but not right now. But eventually, that's going to be happening. I'm in no rush for that. But I want to make sure everything is tight and right before I do it. But check out Justin's show. Believe me, you will be blessed by it, okay? All right, for real this time, for real this time. I'm out. God bless. It's been an interesting adventure tonight, and I hope you all enjoyed the broadcast. If you ever miss a show or would like to go back and revisit or re-listen to an old one, every show is archived in high-quality, streamed on my website, 
nextchapterradio.blogspot.com. Now, there you'll find every broadcast dated and summarized for your convenience. Please don't forget to scroll down on the page and click on the words old or post to be taken to more pages of archived shows. You'll soon be able to find my shows broadcast by the Fourth Watch Radio Network on Blog Talk Radio as well as Shoutcast. Right now, you can catch my shows on iTunes and on Spreaker. Now, if you have an iPhone, you can find that show in the podcast app. But until then, stay tuned in via nextchapterradio.blogspot.com for the latest shows. Now, if Next Chapter Radio has ministered to you and you would like to send a love gift or or tied into the ministry, you can follow the PayPal link that's going to be on our website, which is coming up real soon. That's 4WRN.com, which stands for Fourth Watch Radio Network. That's 4WRN.com. That is going to be our new website, and all you have to do is look for the PayPal link and bless us in our ministry as we go about doing God's work. But until then, I bid you all a week filled with grace and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see you all next week. God bless and good night.